Welcome, everybody, to this third The Great Change webinar. And uh, let's start uh, with uh, Bo. I'm um, Bo Burlingham. I'm a, right, a, currently a contributor, a contributing writer to Forbes magazine. Uh, for 35 years, I was an editor at, uh, at Inc. magazine. I uh, started there in the early 1980s, and uh, um, and I've written several books. Uh, I think probably the most well-known of them is a book called Small Giants, Companies That Choose to Be Great Instead of Big. And I will say that uh, if I had known uh, Gainesville Health and Fitness, but before I wrote the book, they would have been in it. Uh, we've had to honor them afterwards. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Stephen, please. Hi, I'm Steve Schwartz. I'm the CEO of Midtown Athletic Clubs. We were started 50 years ago by my father as a tennis club business, uh, and we still operate the world's uh, most successful indoor tennis club. But uh, we now have eight large upscale uh, sports resorts, most at uh, the high end of the pricing market. And uh, we have some, uh, uh, some of the cutting edge uh, concepts at that end of the, of the spectrum in uh, eight locations around North America, mostly around Chicago, but also in Montreal, New York, Georgia, and Florida. We also run a business that manages corporate fitness centers and hospital wellness centers. We have about 25 locations we manage for other people. Thank you, Stephen. Jay. Hi, I'm Jay Blondie with URSA, the International Health Racket and Sports Club Association. Uh, we are the global association for the industry with over 10,000 members globally. Uh, that's club members and supplier member companies. Over half of our membership is outside the United States. A lot of people don't realize that, but we, we have uh, membership through a lot of federations like ACAD in Brazil and, and Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, uh, as well as Europe. Um, despite my youthful appearance, uh, this is my 30th year with URSA. So, uh, you know, I've worked in a lot of different areas and I'm currently part of the uh, four person executive team overseeing everything that URSA does. Thank you, Jay. Mark Miller. Uh, Mark Miller, Chief Operating Officer with Merit Clubs. Um, we're a chain of nine clubs in Baltimore, Maryland. Much like Stephen, we're the high end clubs in the market. Um, multi purpose, family. Um, outdoor pool, water parks, all that fun stuff. We also have a consulting and management division. We have four um, corporate fitness centers and four outdoor pools that we manage. And then I also chair a Rex GM round table. Uh, I've been part of the Rex round tables for 17 years now. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Erti. Hi, uh, I'm Erti, I'm a CEO of My Fitness Group. Um, we operate in uh, three countries. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, small countries in the Nordics. Uh, we have a total of uh, 48 clubs and um, around 100,000 members. And um, uh, we have uh, three different brands, uh, but in general, two different concepts. Uh, My Fitness is our premium brand, and uh, Gym is our low cost brand. And our low cost. Um, um, is approximately a little bit less than 30% of our total uh, volumes. And currently everything is shut down and we're waiting to be reopened again. Thank you. Also, I've, been, I've been with the Rex since 2014. And as a group, we've been with the Eaters Hub also for, uh, I think since beginning almost since 2008 or, or nine. Thank you. Varpu. Hello everyone, I'm Varpu from Finland. We have three prime fitness clubs here in Tampere, Finland, and 11 low-cost gyms all over the south of Finland. And my mother is the CEO and founder, and I'm business development right now, I'm the next generation. And GoGo as a company just turned 30 this year, so it's our anniversary year. Thank you very much. And we also have with us Zorica for any technical assistance. Andrea, if you want to ask some question about Rex and Gabriella. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, and Gabriela also for question and uh, answers. Gabriela, would mm -hmm. like to say something about question and answer? Pardon, say that again. Would you like to uh, say something about how to write the question? Uh, I am already answering some uh, which we have received. Um, a, a lot of questions now will probably get their answers as the panelists speak, uh, but we'll concentrate at the end, perhaps if there are some more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, thank you very much. Let's start uh, with the first topic. Let's start with the bow. Bo, you have uh, uh, met a lot of uh, very visionary uh, entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs and uh, many others. What do you think is the common uh, point between uh, all these visionary entrepreneurs? What is uh, common in their mindset, well, behaviors? The first thing I'd say is that um, we put too much emphasis on that, that uh, in fact, I've met lots of great entrepreneurs, most of them uh, not nearly as well known as Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or whoever. And uh, um, if, I, if I look at what they have in mind, it's, uh, it, it's they have a very clear sense of who they are, what they want and why. And I think that that is one of the most important uh, qualities of any entrepreneur is that clarity for two reasons. Number one, you'll make much better decisions. If you don't have that clarity about who you are, what you want, and why, um, you know, you wind up doing what other people want. Um, and uh, that's not, you know, this is not something that most of us uh, figure out quickly. I mean, it's something that we, most of us spend all of our lives uh, trying to uh, figure out exactly um, who we are, what we want, and why. Uh, but that is something that's very clear about great entrepreneurs, is they have a very clear understanding of that. Um, and, y you know, in terms of the way that they think, there's a quite a wide range, uh, um, most of which you are all familiar with, which because you've read about them uh, in terms of uh, their understanding of where they're going. And, uh, you know, I was talking earlier about Steve Jobs uh, when I had the opportunity to interview him in 1989. I, the thing that struck me the most was uh, that it was, uh, you know, it was a period before he returned to Apple, actually. And he was still at Next Computer, where uh, he was developing workstations, and they were developing an operating system, which ultimately became the, uh, you know, the iOS, the uh, operating system for all the Apple computers. Um, but uh, at that time, uh, you know, he was still. You had the sense in talking to him that he still had this view of the future, that he sort of knew that there were all kinds of things that um, you could do with uh, computers uh, that w we hadn't even touched the surface of. And of course, when he got back to Apple, you know, there were all of those, in those things that have really sort of changed our world, uh, you know, including the, uh, the um, iPhone, um, the iPod initially, and then later the iPad and the um, the notebook, uh, you know. And I, I've I've often wondered whether I mean he didn't actually specifically talk about any of those things, but he talked about um, what it was that motivated him and what it was that he saw uh, going forward. And you did have the sense that you were talking to somebody, um, as, I, as I've said to others, it was sort of like talking to Beethoven before he wrote symphonies. Um, he, he had this incredible uh, sense that you were in the presence of someone who was able to sort of see the future. Uh, and uh, 
Um, I suppose that has a lot to do with uh, his imagination and his curiosity uh, and with other factors that are just inherent in him as a human being. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Stephen, Chicago. <laughs> What's happening in Chicago? <laughs> what are you doing there now in this period? I, uh, just one moment. I got okay. it. In the United States in general, all of our clubs, including in Canada, have been closed and have been closed since March 15th or 17th in that range. Chicago, where we have our biggest concentration of clubs, everything is, clo everything is closed. You really, um, some people are going to their offices, uh, some essential construction is going on, that's about it. Um, we are taking this, uh, I, we've laid off our entire staff with the exception of a few people at the headquarters and two people or three people at each club. We're taking this time to uh, relook at how we operate and how we are structured and we're trying to decide uh is this a time to set some reset buttons and change things uh, going forward we don't know when we will be allowed to reopen i've been in touch with the mayor's office and we're involved on a committee to try and determine the protocols and procedures for reopening my biggest concern is uh, because we don't have a lot of governmental support here and we didn't qualify, for too, we're too big to qualify for a lot of the programs that were uh, uh, put out, at least in the first round. Uh, our, my biggest concern is if we open too soon, uh, it may be devastating. Hmm. Okay. I don't know what other things you're looking for, Fausto, but that's... Uh... Yeah, 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 thank you very much. Jay, uh, Jay, what's uh, you are in touch with uh, thousands of clubs around uh, the world and uh, with Ursa. What uh, could you tell us? Uh, sure. Um, well, first off, you know, you talk about Steve Jobs, and, and you know, that's a good transition to Steve Schwartz because his father, Alan, was one of the founding members of Ursa over 40 years ago. And Ursa was founded really for club operators at that time. You know, there was really, really very little information being shared. And, and these visionary operators said, hey, look, why reinvent the wheel? Let's start sharing information. And that's how Ursa was founded. And so we take, we've always taken that spirit uh, through our, our whole history. And one of the things, the first things we did uh, when this was developing in February was uh, decided to make, become a clearinghouse for all uh, information regarding the coronavirus. So we set up a web page and, and Fausto is showing it right there, versus.org slash coronavirus. And we immediately made the decision to make all resources free to everyone in the industry. We, uh, you know, knowing that this virus was, you know, started in Asia and then, and then, you know, progressed to Europe and the United States, we went out to the Asia clubs first, uh, Colin Grant and Pure Gyms and, and said, you know, ask them, did a webinar about how they were preparing for the closing. And then two weeks later did one on how they were starting to reopen their clubs. We did a, a great webinar the other day with uh, Jose Textera from SC Fitness in Portugal. And we've also done videos regarding, um, you know, what to do during the, during the sh shutdown, like, you know, negotiating with your landlord. We put together a cost cutting checklist of things you could do uh, and so we wanted to be a clearinghouse, not only to step up our own production of content to help clubs, but also uh, pull together everything that the industry is doing, much like what Rex is doing with these uh, forums. So, you know, the big message is don't reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of clubs doing a lot of innovative things to try to get through this and you can learn from others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. And uh, Mark. Yeah, so um, our clubs have been closed since March 17th. Um, we're predominantly in Maryland. Um, and uh, much like Stephen said, we had to put um, about 800 of our employees on a leave of absence. We have about 48 employees that are still working. Um, and we're taking care of um, all of our employees' health benefits that were on our program originally. Um, we're in our clubs doing maintenance projects, doing cleanings, um, 
we have a really strong team. I'm really proud of my whole team and all that and what they've done. Um, it's almost like they've advanced our business. Um, we're, we're doing virtual programming, Facebook Live classes, um, you know, providing workouts for people, keeping our members engaged throughout this whole thing, um, communicating with them during this period of time. And I think that's really been beneficial. We've gotten a lot of good feedback and all that. Um, you know, the challenge for us is, you know, when we will be able to reopen and how we'll be able to reopen because we have still a, a lot of things that are um, unknown. So we're looking at like our outdoor pools. What does the physical spacing look like? What happens inside the clubs? I think the benefit has been that um, Ursa's provided some great webinars from um, Pure Gym over in China to get some insight into that. All the recs um, meetings, um, whether it's this one, Fausto, or the one that um, we're doing with regards to club solutions and just sharing. I think one of the things that I've seen that's been just so phenomenal is that the industry has come together so much and everyone is sharing everything we possibly can and looking at how we can, you know, advance our clubs, take care of our employees, take care of our members and get back to some sort of normal, whatever that may look like. Um, we're all going to figure this thing out together. And I think this unification that's bringing all of us across the globe um, together is really something that's pretty powerful and pretty strong that you just do not see um, under circumstances. Thank you, Mark. Okay, let's go back to Europe, North Europe, Erki, the Baltics country. So uh, we've been closed uh, for about um, 30 uh, five days now. Um, initially, it was a big shock. And uh, what we did was uh, we tried to just analyze the cost and see uh, what our, our resources are. Um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately in the future, we also made quite a um, big acquisition uh, end of January. So we're in, very much involved in there. And uh, we're also building uh, two new additional clubs. So we basically had to put everything on hold um, and try to figure, figure out financially uh, what we can do. Um, uh, secondly, of course, uh, number one, our uh, team, we have approximately 900 uh, people. So um, we uh, basically made agreement with our employees on the uh, different uh, salary cuts. Uh, we've been trying to use as much as uh, government support as we uh, can get. Um, and now uh, this part is sort of finally, um, um, it's in a stable uh, phase. Uh, at the same time, we've always been doing something. So, um, um, and um, wanted to continue to some type of development and not just to put ourselves completely on hold. So we have a created online platform, which is called the NetFit. So we're trying to do serve our members as much as possible uh, through um, online uh, services and um, and yeah so uh, all our members memberships are put on hold so it, it is approximately 100,000 members and um, so we are working out the plan how to regroup and um, and looking very much forward uh, to open uh, the clubs again and, and I think it's also a good opportunity now for us and our team to really focus how to become better again. Um, I think we really met the members' uh, needs before, and now I think we have to uh, really exceed um, everything when we open up. And uh, I think it's a little bit maybe good that Bo uh, had the first uh, part of introduction. I think there's a lot of good stuff in his, uh, uh, in his book. Uh, one can uh, learn from how to really become a great and maybe not that big, uh, but just a little bit uh, step down and, and focus on, the, um, on all the qualities uh, what one can offer. Thank you, Erki. And now let's go to a country that is one of a few countries uh, in the world that, where they never closed uh, gyms and other kind of activities. Varko, what's happening in Finland? I, I got it. Um, I think the coronavirus is still on its way to Finland. We only have 3,500 cases of coronavirus and only 90 people have passed altogether. 
all school, schools and government-owned facet, facilities are closed and all restaurants and bars were forced to close at the end of March. But all gyms, apart from a couple maybe, um, are open. Mm. And also our, all, all of our clubs are open. A couple of clubs have limited hours due to the premises where they are. And normally we have a hundred classes a week per club here in where we live in the prime clubs. But now we have about 30 um, fitness classes a week and we only take <clears throat> 10 people to a class and to the gym floor there is no restrictions and uh, we don't need it quite frankly because we only have 20 to 30 percent um, usage in our clubs mm -hmm. not too many people are coming okay what about uh, also uh, do you have people asking for joining yes a, few, oh, yeah? a day your day, you still have your day asking for joining the gym. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Now uh, let's go to the strategy. Hey, here I have uh, Abo. Can you do you recognize these books? Small giants. <laughs> Just a moment. I'll uh, unmute you, Bo. Okay. Yeah, okay. I've seen that before. <laughs> your, your book, but. They are wonderful book, Small Giants, I really love it. And uh, I'd like to ask one question. In your view, what moves can we make in our fitness industry as a collective, of course, to have a significant impact in order to create a better planet for all of us uh, to live in? Because we know that uh, you can never be healthier than the, the place where you live. Uh yeah, that's absolutely true. And I have, I have to say, I have to say, I love the fitness industry. I, uh, I just think you guys are wonderful. And I would uh, uh, particularly take note of what Mark was talking about, namely, the sense in which people have come together and are really learning from each other about how best to cope with uh, what's happening now. And, uh, how best to look forward to what's, what's going to happen. I mean, <clears throat> you know, obviously the, 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 uh, most of what I know about the fitness industry, I have learned from uh, obviously Rex and uh, uh, also from uh, specifically from Joe Cerulli at uh, Gainesville Health and Fitness in Florida. And, and, Gainesville Health and Fitness is among all businesses, not just the fitness businesses. It's an example of a company that has really uplifted its whole community. Uh, I mean, it it actually was very much a part of a plan uh, to uh, actually they won an award for Gainesville as uh, they let it they let a they let a a drive throughout the community to have uh, Gainesville recognized as the uh, number one wellness wellness community in America, and uh, they were the only one. This is a this was a program that uh, was available to anybody, and nobody had ever won the gold award, but Gainesville won the gold award. Um, and that was that was really because of Gainesville Health and Fitness. And I, I just think that there's a way in which uh, the fitness industry can raise the uh, awareness about the importance of this. I mean, I think you've got a tremendous platform right now because I think everybody is focused on health um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, right now and you know, if if obviously if you're sick, uh, you know, and you're you're thinking about that, you're going to look to the hospitals. And but if you're not sick, which is of course 99 percent of people in the world, who are you going to look to? You're going to look to the what are you? You're the uh, wellness and fitness experts in your community, 
And that is uh, a role that is, I would say, more important today than at any time in, in that I can remember, uh, because it has such an important impact on so many, on, on everybody, really. I mean, I have to say that uh, I, I envy uh, Varpu. Uh, I think most Americans sort of envy Sweden and Finland right now because uh, we certainly wish, I mean, I miss my gym and uh, uh, I, w I wish it were open. And in, in fact, I'm getting quite impatient uh, f for it to reopen. But uh, um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, what you guys are doing uh, has never been uh, more relevant to the world at large. And uh, I, I really, I mean, you know, I'm sure that Jay sees this all the time through URSA, um, that this is really, this is, this is really a time for you to lead the way. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Thank you. Steven, how do you imagine the future? <laughs> the future, no, <laughs> in uh, one year. Just one moment, I am with you. Okay. Uh, I think I'd like to back up for a second uh, and say it's not really how I imagine the future is is maybe interesting. I think in a, in a word, uh, people will value places where they can be active and where they can be social more. Um, but I think we don't know what the future will look like because the economic devastation that this could have has a wide range of possible outcomes. Um, and so if I, my seat at the table is to think really much more about this next phase that we're in. The way I, this is a United, this may be a United States only phenomenon because of our lack of social support, but I, you've heard of the phrase crash and burn. I've changed it to cash and burn. How much cash do you have and what is your burn rate? That's all I was concerned about when we closed and it still remains my biggest concern today. Our company, for example, the minute we open our payroll goes to a million dollars a week. How many weeks can you be burning? And, it, and the other operating costs are another million dollars a week. So let's call it $2 million a week. How much revenue can you bring in when you open the doors if only 20% of the people come back? So the risk, number one, was in closing. How fast could you get, how much cash could you keep and how low could your burn rate be? Determines your length of survival. Then when you open up, you're gonna have a position where your cash burn bumps dramatically, but your income may not. So. To Bo, send me a chat question. What is my concern is that if we have to open and then are closed, because if we open, increase our burn rate, decrease our cash, then we're closed again, we have less resource to stay alive. So the future is terrific. I just want to be here to see it. And I think the most important thing to do right now is make sure we get there. Now, I may be Debbie Downer. My friends accuse me of being too negative. But I have an old saying in my business, which is the upside takes care of itself. I have to worry about what it, making sure I can get there. I love our market position. I, our average club does $15 million in revenue. We have one club at $40 million. We have a lot of people who are willing to pay a lot of money who like what we do. I hope they have jobs. I think they will. But I got to make sure that we can get there. Yeah. And I'm concerned about that. And I think that some people are racing to open because they want the revenue, but they don't understand the risk of being closed again. Yeah. Like yeah. they were in Singapore. Yeah, right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Jay, what uh, the ERSA 
can do for the future or are you looking to do or organize? What do, you, what do you think? Well, I think Steve hit the nail on the head. I mean, you know, Singapore is a great example where they had the virus under control. The clubs, uh, you know, uh, Pure Gym had closed for almost two months. And then the government in Asia, the government's very specific about, you know, providing guidance and regulations. And they had specific guidance about, you know, depending on the size of the club, how many people could be in the club, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, they had check-ins, they had all these procedures in place. And then, you know, a day after they opened one club, there was a, a COVID-9 uh, person who had traveled from another country and had used the club and they had the government shut the whole club down. And then they ended up, that was a ripple effect. They ended up shutting down multiple clubs. Uh, and that's the danger that Steve's talking about. So I do think that, you know, we're looking at this as a 12 to 18 month uh, strategy where you've got to plan very carefully for the reopening, you know, with local guidance and making sure you have a plan in place. I just, over the weekend, I got a plan from Will's uh, Fitness in China, over 170 club chain, and they have a detailed, uh, you know, policies and procedures about how they're reopening their clubs and, you know, everything that, what happens when a person comes in, what, you know, how, how often they're cleaning. I mean, they're very specific. And in the U S you know, you're not going to get that kind of guidance from your government. You're going to get, you're going to get some general guidelines like the Trump administration has put out saying, you know, businesses can reopen based on their local, uh, their, their governors or whatnot, but that's, it's going to be up to the clubs to use this downtime to really put together a strategy of how will you reopen? Think about every scenario that's going to happen once you reopen. How are you going to communicate to the public that you're a safe environment? Or, you know, are you, uh, you know, covering every other piece of uh, cardio equipment? Are you limiting the people that go to your clubs? Do you have a sign up for letting people into your clubs? And, and that's, you know, that is, uh, you know, the challenge. And, and Steve is exactly right. The, the companies that aren't managing their cash flow and really thinking about, you know, how to be smart are the ones that, you know, there are going to be companies that go out of business out of this. That's just inevitable. And we no, want a smart company that comes out with a plan as opposed to making up as you go. And that's what we're trying to advise clubs. Jay, Jay uh, Fausto, if I could just interject, I think it's very important for us to work with our local communities to make d d governments to make sure, and, and, and we have to specifically talk to them about what happens when people test positive, our employees and our staff and our members, they will. If their reaction is to close us, we're better closed, not open. And the problem in America is there isn't that wide way, there isn't widespread testing, there isn't, you know, people can't even get tests. Employees, you know, need to be able to say, all right, here's a test that we can give you and this is the procedure that happens if somebody is positive. But we're a long ways away from any type of widespread opening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mark, you are in connection with a lot also of other uh, American operator uh, that belongs to Rex. What's your opinion of the future? Or what we can do in order to be ready for the future? Well, I mean, I, I think a lot of us echo what Stephen was saying in the sense that you got to be prepared financially because even though some organizations are getting the, you know, whether it's the SBA loan or the PPP program, you know, if we end up reopening and then we end up shutting back down, you know, that money is a very limited window where you have to pay it back. And in order to be forgiven, you have to follow certain guidelines. So, you know, it's like a roller coaster effect that we have to be careful with as operators and doing this thing strategically, which I think goes to, you know, you got to have a very solid plan. You got to be thinking all these things through. And, and the other aspects that we're thinking about, you know, not only from a financial perspective, but now you got to start to look at your employees and, you know, can you provide a safe work environment for them? And what are the precautions that you're going to take in order to get there? Um, what is the financial contribution that you have to do in order to get your facilities ready to reopen? So, you know, an example in, in, in our clubs, we've already bought, um, you know, guns for cleaning. We bought thermometers for checking people's temperatures. We bought um, face guards, shields for, um, you know, the put on our desks and all that to protect our staff from, 
interactions and all that. But that's, you know, that just mitigates a little bit of the risk. You know, there's other things that we still have to put in place that, you know, our investments in our facilities, which is going to go back to that cash burn rate. Um, and then we have to look at it from a member perspective. You know, can we provide an environment that members want to come back to and feel comfortable coming back to? And how are we going to do that? And how are we going to run the different scenarios? Because, you know, this is not going to be a, we open back and we're back to normal. This is going to be a new 12 to 18 month realization of how people behave and how we do things as a business right now. And, and this will always be a new normal. You know, this, this concept of physical spacing is going to be here for a long time and we need to figure out how to work through this. Um, you know, people coming into your facilities with regards to a case and then how do you clean, how do you sanitize and what's the PR that you do around that? Because, you know, there could also be some fallout of how you do this the right way and building trust within your communities and all that and people willing to come back and do that. Um, so there's a lot of these variables that you need to be talking through with your teams and thinking through every aspect. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to one, financially, can we do it? Two, can we take care of our employees and protect them? Three, can we provide a level of service that the members can trust and are willing to come back to because they're consuming fitness differently today? And, you know, we have to put all these variables on a table. We have to think through this and we can't just think for the next 30 day window. We have to be thinking for a 12 to 18 month period with several different phases and a staggered approach and doing this the right way um, so that we can at the end of this, you know, really come out strong as an organization and as an industry. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Erki. Uh, what's your uh, opinion? Uh, of course, for a short term, uh, until the opening when the revenue is basically zero. I agree with the Stephen. It's uh, the cash burn uh, rate um, is very crucial. Um, same for us. Uh, we try to do as much as possible to uh, minimize the cost and um, also thinking a little bit in, um, in more of the long term. Uh, can we do, can we cut uh, um, the level of the cost and not really damage the quality. So we have started to think uh, about the processes, what we have historically done and maybe uh, what can be uh, done differently. Uh, that's one thing. I think second, um, I mean, we have accepted, I guess, more or less the new normal uh, and what is the new normal going forward. And uh, I think if you have a, a number of clubs you operate you have to think what is the what is the best model uh, going forward and you really have to adjust the model to the current situation um, um, we i'm really looking forward to see um, how different segments um, will um, um, sort of restore uh, we have a premium and then we have a low cost is it really like the cost issue is is it more safety issue where uh, in a premium, you usually have less member per square meters. I think that would be very interesting to see. But, but, but uh, what I'm almost certain is that the online approach probably will stay. It will be the um, a catalyst probably for any fitness uh, chain or a club. And this is, I'm actually quite big believer that uh, uh, the, the clubs who focus on online services as well uh, will have a big advantage going forward, especially if the new virus uh, can, uh, can come also in the future. So, uh, and I think then it's a really question, can we educate our members also to pay uh, for online services? I think that's a really big uh, sort of question or big task uh, to do. And, uh, and all other things, I, I think we are talking with a team um, management team, maybe how to simplify some of the features, what we have today, uh, whether it's, for example, um, become more cashless, uh, more self-service, uh, all those things. I think it's uh, now it's a great time uh, to really think um, what to do uh, when you open up or, or what to do um, at some point in the future. Okay, Erti. Thank you very much. Varpu. We can consider you in uh, phase two after the lockdown uh, and after the end of the tunnel, don't you? 
Sorry, what do you mean? That, uh, we consider Finland that you have already passed the, the, the peak, uh, you are recovering. You are now no. in a new phase or not? No, the peak is only coming. We try to stay open as long as we can, because when we close, we have to stop all our um, invoicing. Okay. So we try to stay open as long as possible, but the peak is probably here in a month or in, a t in two months. Oh, we're hanging. Right. Uh, what do you think, think is the uh, new uh, normal after the peak, when you will uh, reopen? A lot the same things as already mentioned. A lot of um, um, cleaning and hygiene and distancing. Lucky for us, we have so big gyms and so big areas here. It's easy for people to feel safe. But I think that's the key for the members to feel safe. So as long as we're communicating and we are informing them how we are doing things and how we are taking care of them and watch that everybody uh, listens to our guidelines, follows the rules, I think that will make the difference. Yeah, are you doing something digitally? Are you do providing some uh, solutions? Yes, we are live streaming classes and offering pre-recorded classes mainly on Facebook Live also. It's, um, it has been a really good thing to do. People feel that they're part of GoGo, -Go, even though they are further away. They, um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback on it. And we, all, we also have teamed up with a local newspaper and they are streaming our classes, which has been a really good deal for us also. And then we are doing a lot of uh, digitalization, digitalization here in GoGo. -Go. So hopefully by fall, we'll have all these cool features on online and um, uh, the online store will be much better. And we will for sure continue teaching live classes and live events, Zoom events. They have been really cool in my opinion. And we have a lot of young people, I think that will attract even more young people to join. Plus, I think what will be good is um, these easy introductory courses that can be done from home. So they can still buy the membership, but we can offer them some low, like kind of easy, easier membership, if I can say that. But they can do, they can be members from home and learn how we do things and how we do classes and how they will learn to, you know, just go at it easier and then they can join us fully and come, come here to the gym a little bit later. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Varko. Now, Gabriela, it's your time and uh, it's time of the attendees for the questions and uh, answers. And uh, have you seen some interesting questions? Of course, they are all interesting, but... Uh, yes, quite, quite a few, but uh, um, I'll concentrate on one that is from John from the UK, um, who has, wants to address the entire panel. And uh, Jay, you touched on it uh, in your second part. He, um, he is keen for you to um, give your ideas or suggestions, recommendations on a program, mandatory back to the gym induction program, if you have any. Well, I think you have to take, you know, first your direction from your local government and what, what is the situation in your community? What are, what are the restrictions, the social distancing restrictions that are in place? And once you know that, then it goes back to what a lot on the panel have said, you need to to let the community know that you're a safe place to go and how and the steps you are taking to make sure you are safe. And, and that's, that's really critical. I mean, use this time to really put together a plan as to how will you reopen? How will you deal with uh, somebody that tests positive or, or, um, and, and make sure your staff are safe and, and everything that's been talked about. I mean, you really need to have a detailed plan and you really need to make sure that you communicate everything you're doing around cleanliness and safety and, and restrictions because, you know, you know, Steve mentioned the, the quote of, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And, and there are people that 
are simply will be afraid to go anywhere and you need to really reassure them when you get to that point where you feel it's safe in the community because social distancing is only a pause button. It is not a cure. And until there is a, uh, a vaccine or effective therapies, people are, you know, can still get this virus. And that's really the, the key to this whole uh, shutdown is that we are not out of this by any means for several months to come. And out <clears throat> the um, club um, owners, uh, any, anyone in this group planning to use this uh, as an opportunity to get their members base back onto their gyms in a better way than they did before the pande pandemic? Varpu? Sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. Uh, basically, um, can this mandatory uh, program um, be used to um, ensure that the members you get back on the gym are better than the ones before the pandemic. What, what do you mean mandatory program? So the question is, um, is anyone in this group planning to use this as an opportunity, this situation as an opportunity to get their member base back into their gyms in a better way than they did before the pandemic. Eric? Eric. Yeah, um, if I could interrupt. Um, the way I see it, I think we're in a great business. Um, of course, now it's probably you know, one of the worst businesses to be in, uh, in this situation. But if you really think about it, uh, if the clubs and the governments, at some point they can promote um, health. And if you think about it, uh, it's not the virus what it kills, right? It's an Im immune system what kills. So I think the health uh, uh, issues are becoming more and more important. So I think it's a very good platform to basically promote uh, fitness. So uh, I think, and I hope that this is something that uh, if everything more or less feels safe or if everything is safe, <laughs> So then I think uh, the fitness clubs and fitness industry can really use this argument um, on their behalf. And, and I think the same, uh, the government should be very supportive um, on this sort of be on the same line with us. So uh, I think that's mm -hmm. probably the, the main, uh, um, main topic that can be uh, brought up when um, we allow to open, open again. Mark, on a practical level, how would you communicate to your members that what um, measures have been, have been taken to ensure that they are safe? Um, I think, well, you have to look at a couple different ways of communicating it. So, I, you know, I think right now we're using um, emails, we're using text messaging, we're using um, Facebook posts and all that. But I think one of the things that we're trying to do is um, not only communicate what we're doing, but visually show people. So taking photos of our staff that's cleaning, um, where we're cleaning, how we're cleaning, making sure like we're trying to be as transparent as possible. Um, in all of our new manuals that we're creating and all that, when we are bringing kids back, parents back, we're sharing with them, you know, what is the cleaning products we use? How do we clean their toys? How do we clean the equipment? Um, why each of these things is important, how it kills the COVID virus, um, so that we can be as transparent as possible in everything we're doing and, you know, answering as many questions as we possibly can. And then, you know, we have to ensure that this message is consistent. So we have to do a lot of staff training and development as well, because, you know, like Stephen said, people are just fearful right now and, they're, and it's, it's an unknown thing. So the more transparent, the more clarity that we can do, um, we have to do that, but we all have to understand that everyone needs to be flexible and agile in this because things change by the day. And you know, as we learn new information, we gotta be willing to move um, in those types of things that help protect our business, our members and our employees. Right. And um, John again says that uh, we would be hoping uh, we take a lead on getting our members, uh, well, he's talking about, you know, the government element. So he's saying, uh, we'll be hoping we get a lead on uh, getting our members back with a through induction program or a thorough in induction program in the correct way that suits us 
and them rather than wait on the government guidelines. So basically, it, it, would, would you be planning, Stephen, would you suggest that it's a good idea to have a, 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 the club's own mandate uh, on, uh, you know, a, a program to ensure that the members get back, come back? I would say that uh, it's it's very important that okay. each club develop their set of guidelines, policies, procedures, and that they make right. them transparent to the members and to the local government. But I will also tell you, and I've now spoken to many, many club operators, and you can probably all relate to this, there are a number of dopes in our business, people who are willing to make very short-term decisions. You know, there's tremendous number of opinions as to what the right thing to do is. And historically, our industry has had some people do some very bad things. The press, the media, will take those examples and that will further fear, provide fear and government pushback. So it's even more important that you put your stuff together, make it transparent, and proactively talk to your local government so that they understand what you're doing and so that you distinguish yourself from others. In my own calls with four major club chain owners over the weekend in the Chicago area, I got a different answer from every single one as to what they thought should be done. Mm -hmm. What about you, Bo? What would you say about that? Well, I don't know. I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm learning from all of you, actually. And uh, uh, in 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 terms of what uh, needs to be done right now, I mean, I guess the thing that keeps uh, occurring to me is that there's still an awful lot that we really don't know about this disease. I mean, there was a Stanford study that was done of Santa Clara County in California, which revealed where they, they looked at uh, how many people, they did a survey of like 3,600 uh, people, just random people, and they tested them to see if they had the antibodies, uh, which would uh, they they would only have if they had had the disease. And it turned out that something like some enormous number, like 15% of them, uh, had the antibodies. What that means is that a great many more people have had this disease and didn't know it. Uh, or they had such minor symptoms that it didn't really uh, occur to them at all. Now, this is all something that this is all the type of information I mean, frankly, I don't know why that sort of a test isn't being done absolutely all over the country or mm -hmm. all over the world, because uh, as I say, we don't really know um, exactly how uh, widespread this disease is or, or what, the, uh, what the infection, if the, if the infection rate is that easy. I mean, I have a friend uh, uh, who has uh, there are four people in in his family. Uh, three of them got the virus and tested positive, and one of them didn't. Why didn't that one Why didn't that one person not get it after living with the other three who had it? Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, the only thing is, uh, it, it seems to be the best opportunity for the fitness industry to uh, grab this chance to. Uh, proactively uh, lead the way, like Fausto was saying in the introduction. So, um, um, can I address another question, Fausto? Is there a is there time? Yeah, Mark, try to say something. Gabrielle, real real quick. I I think you know from all this and what Bo is saying and everyone else has said today. I think you know there's going to be a greater emphasis from everybody, not just our members, but our communities as a whole with regards to people's health. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna value it in a much different arena. 
And we as operators have that ability that if we can position ourselves properly, you know, we can really do a great service to our communities by helping people really build up their immunity, build their health, build their fitness, whatever it may be. But I also think that there's going to be an education or a re-education of members as well as to how to behave in fitness centers, you know, because it's not something that we alone and our teams alone can do. You know, we need the members in our clubs to do their share of it, which is be cognizant of social distancing, you know, clean up after themselves, help sanitize, be smart enough to know that if they are feeling ill and all that, they should forego the gym. And so, you know, I think there's going to be, you know, that much on our part is to also help re-educate our members on what they need to be doing in our facilities to protect other members and also to protect themselves. Sure, that's what the mandate should include, for example, like, you know, a re-education for the, for the members. And um, is there another, is there a time for another question, Fausto? Yeah, it's fine. Let's go with the last question. Um, okay, so I'm skipping around. Um, now, uh, we have a question from Leila. Uh, do you think online fitness will be uh, our new additional renew, um, review, sorry, uh, revenue stream? So eventually, even, I guess it means after the reopening, uh, will it be also uh, the new additional revenue stream and will you implement online membership type as an option? Vapu, were you, would you be able to comment on that? Yeah, I think for sure. I think it's a huge opportunity for us to develop a new um, service or a new product to sell. And I think a lot of people will be interested in it after the epidemic. And so, yeah, we'll, we will definitely build at least one or two different types of right. So to, to have alongside when, uh, when everything is over, presumably. Yeah. Right. Anybody else? Okay. I think we, we have come to the end. So if I would like to uh, let Bo close the, the webinar, the great change with uh, what's your mantra, Bo? What's the mantra that you've heard in uh, saying by these all visionary people that you have met so far? Well, I, I, I think we all have a lot to learn. And uh, I mean, I've just been sitting here listening to all of you and learning an awful lot about the industry that uh, I didn't know before. And uh, uh, I think we have a lot to learn from each other, and I think this uh, this opportunity that you've created, uh, Fausto, for uh, for people to learn from each other is really tremendous because there are a whole lot of unknowns. And you know, of course, the the point that uh, Stephen was making about cash and burn that's true for every business out there. Um, you, you know that uh, this is something that uh, we're going to have to, uh, every business is going to have to be looking at it. And it's true, some businesses aren't going to make it. I was a little surprised that Stephen said that he felt that he was too big uh, to, to get the money from uh, uh, PPP, because I was reading this morning that uh, Shake Shack <laughs> had, had gotten money and that there are actually a lot of big companies uh, that have have gotten money, but uh, I I think that I think that you know this is really you guys really do have this uh, opportunity. You know, opportunities come from change. Uh, when change happens, there's always opportunities, and all of the great opportunities have happened because of change, and and a lot of those changes in our lifetimes has, have been technological changes. This is a, this is as you say, um, Fausto, in naming this program. This is a great change, and what that means is that whatever dangers there are out there, there are tremendous opportunities as well. And I think that you know what Varpu was talking about, 
in terms of uh, in terms of the digital possibility. I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about it. Gee, yeah, that that I could see how that could be something that would really catch on, and that uh, uh, you know it would become a thing. It would become something that uh, people would uh, would get used to. I I I don't you know I don't know. Uh, I don't have any great insights into the future. I wish I did. I'd be a lot richer. Um, uh, but uh, I, uh, I, I do think that the fitness industry really uh, has a tremendous role to play uh, in the future. And the question is, um, you know, obviously, you know, we have to get through the reopening. But there are going to be uh, opportunities that somehow you have to uh, communicate to the public at large. I mean, I do think that if if the point comes, it's not certainly not going to happen in the United States anytime soon, where you can provide testing for everybody who comes in uh, to your facility, that becomes a tremendous thing. Uh, I, I I don't know what it would take to get to that point, but I mean, I've seen on television uh, the tests, there's one from Abbott Labs, where, you know, they, they do a test in, in like 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, to have that capability, um, you know, that's that's a capability that if you had it, it would be a tremendous boon uh, to your business, and it would be also provide the kind of level of comfort that we're talking about for your members that uh, that they know, um, you know, that, that that you're on top of this, and that that you are the people to turn to um, in terms of. Uh, you know, if they're in terms of how they are doing right now and how they should think about the future. Thank you very much, Bo, and thank you to all speakers, panelists. Thank you for all attendees, and see you next week, same day, same hour with the other uh, panelists. And don't forget to answer the survey that you get right after this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you and uh, see you next week. Thank you, Fausto. Thank you. Thanks, Fausto.